Capitalism and Gay Identity by John D'Amelio. John D'Amelio is a historian of the United States and lesbian gay United States history is one of his chief research interests. In this essay, he explains that lesbian and gay people have not been present throughout history, that in the United States, for instance, there was no lesbian or gay identity and subculture until some time in the 19th century when the development of capitalism made our emergence possible. Capitalism required a system of labor based on wages rather than on either a large self-sufficient household or slavery, and wages gave individuals a relative autonomy which was the necessary material condition for the making of lesbianism and gayness. A sound lesbian gay politics in our times, D'Amelio concludes, must be grounded in just a demystified view of our past as he hopes his work in this essay and elsewhere may help to provide. John D'Amelio is the author of Sexual Politics, Sexual Communities, The Making of a Homosexual Minority, 1983, and of Making Trouble, Essays on Gay History, Politics, and the University, 1992, and he is Professor of History at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. For gay men and lesbians, the 1970s were years of significant achievement. Gay liberation and women's liberation changed the sexual landscape of the nation. Hundreds of thousands of gay women and men came out and openly affirmed same-sex eroticism. We won repeal of sodomy laws in half the states, a partial lifting of exclusion of lesbian and gay men from federal employment, civil rights protections in a few dozen cities, the inclusion of gay rights in the platform of the Democratic Party, and the elimination of homosexuality from the psychiatric profession's list of mental illnesses. The gay male subculture expanded and became increasingly visible in large cities, and lesbian feminists pioneered in building alternative institutions and alternative culture that attempted to embody a liberatory vision of the future. In the 1980s, however, the resurgence of an active right-wing, gay men and lesbian faced the future warily. Our victories appeared tenuous and fragile. The relative freedom of the past years seems too recent to be permanent. In some parts of the lesbian and gay male community, a feeling of doom is growing. Analogies with McCarthy's America, when sexual perverts were a special target of the right, and with Nazi Germany, where gays were shipped to concentration camps, surface with increasing frequency. Everywhere, there is the sense that new strategies are in order if we want to preserve our gains and move ahead. I believe that a new, more accurate theory of gay history must be part of this political enterprise. When the gay liberation movement began at the end of the 1960s, gay men and lesbians had no history that we could use to fashion our goals and strategy. In the ensuing years, in building a movement without a knowledge of our history, we instead invented a mythology. This mythical history drew upon personal experience, which we read backward in time. For instance, most lesbians and gay men in the 60s first discovered their homosexual desires in isolation, unaware of others, and without resources for naming and understanding what they felt. From this experience, we constructed a myth of silence, invisibility, and isolation as the essential characteristics of gay life in the past as well as the present. Moreover, because we face so many oppressive laws, public policies, and cultural beliefs, we projected this into an image of the abysmal past, until gay liberation, lesbians, and gay men were always the victims of systemic, undifferentiated, terrible oppression. These myths have limited our political perspective. They have contributed, for instance, to an over-reliance on a strategy of coming out. If every gay man and lesbian in America came out, gay oppression would end, and have allowed us to ignore the institutionalized ways in which homophobia and heterosexism are reproduced. They have encouraged at times an incapacitating despair, especially at moments like the present. How can we unravel a gay oppression so pervasive and unchanging? There is another historical myth that enjoys nearly universal acceptance in the gay movement, the myth of the eternal homosexual. The argument runs something like this. Gay men and lesbians always were and always will be. 
They are everywhere, not just now, but throughout history, in all societies and all periods. This myth served a positive political function in the first years of gay liberation. In the early 1970s, when we battled an ideology that either denied our existence or defined us as psychopathic individuals or freaks of nature, it was empowering to assert that we are everywhere. But in recent years, it has confined us as surely as the most homophobic medical theories and locked our movement in place. Here, I wish to challenge this myth. I want to argue that gay men and lesbians have not always existed. Instead, they are a product of history and have come into existence in a specific historical era. Their emergence is associated with the relations of capitalism. It has been the historical development of capitalism, more specifically its free labor system, that has allowed large numbers of men and women in the late 20th century to call themselves gay, to see themselves as part of a community of similar men and women, and to organize politically on the basis of that identity. Finally, I want to suggest some political lessons we can draw from this view of history. What then are the relationships between the free labor system of capitalism and homosexuality? First, let me review some of the features of capitalism. Under capitalism, workers are free laborers in two ways. We have the freedom to look for a job. We own our ability to work and have the freedom to sell our labor power for wages to anyone willing to buy it. We are also freed from the ownership of anything except our labor power. Most of us do not own the land or the tools that produce what we need, but rather have to work for a living in order to survive. So, if we are free to sell our labor power in the positive sense, we are also freed in the negative sense from any other alternative. This dialectic, the constant interplay between exploitation and some measure of autonomy, informs all of the history of those who have lived under capitalism, as capital, money, used to make more money, expands so does the system of free labor. Capital expands in several ways. Usually, it expands in the same place transforming small firms into larger ones. But it also expands by taking over new areas of production, the weaving of cloth, for instance, or the baking of bread. Finally, capital expands geographically. In the United States, capitalism initially took root in the Northeast at a time when slavery was the dominant system in the South, and when non-capitalist Native American societies occupied the western half of the continent. During the 19th century, capital spread from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and in the 20th century, U.S. capital has penetrated almost every part of the world. The expansion of capital and the spread of wage labor have affected a profound transformation in the structure and function of the nuclear family the ideology of family life, and the meaning of heterosexual relationships. It is these changes in the family that are most directly linked to the appearance of a collective gay life. White colonists in 17th century New England established villages structured around a household economy composed of family units that were basically self-sufficient, independent, and patriarchal. Men, women, and children farmed land owned by the male head of household. Although there was a division of labor between men and women, the family was truly an independent unit of production. The survival of each member depended on the cooperation of all. The home was a workplace where women processed raw farm products into food for daily consumption, where they made clothing, soap, and candles, and where husbands, wives, and children worked together to produce the goods they consumed. By the 19th century, this system of household production was in decline in the Northeast. As merchant capitalists invested the money accumulated through trade in the production of goods, wage labor became more common. Men and women were drawn out of the largely self-sufficient household economy of the colonial era into a capitalist system of free labor. For women in the 19th century, Working for wages rarely lasted beyond marriage. For men, it became a permanent condition. The family was thus no longer an independent unit of production. But although no longer dependent, the family was still interdependent, because capitalism had not expanded very far, because it had not yet taken over or socialized the production of consumer goods, women still performed necessary productive labor in the home, 
Many families no longer produced grain, but wives still baked into bread the flour they bought with their husbands' wages, or when they purchased yarn or cloth, they still made clothing for their families. By the mid-1880s, capitalism had destroyed the economic self-sufficiency of many families, but not the mutual dependence of the members. This transition away from the household family-based economy to a fully developed capitalist free labor economy occurred very slowly over almost two centuries. As late as 1920, 50% of the U.S. population lived in communities of fewer than 2,500 people. The vast majority of blacks in the early 20th century lived outside the free labor economy in a system of sharecropping and tenancy that rested on the family. Not only did independent farming as a way of life still exist for millions of Americans, but even in towns and small cities, women continued to grow and process food, making clothing, and engaging in other kinds of domestic production. But for those people who felt the brunt of these changes, the family took on a new significance as an affective unit, an institution that produced not goods but emotional satisfaction and happiness. By the 1920s, among the white middle class, the ideology surrounding the family described it as the means through which men and women formed satisfying, mutually enhancing relationships and created an environment that nurtured children. The family became the setting for a personal life, sharply distinguished and disconnected from the public world of work and production. The meaning of heterosexual relationships also changed. In New England, the birth rate averaged over seven children per woman of childbearing age. Men and women needed the labor of children. Producing offspring was as necessary for survival as producing grain. Sex was harnessed to procreation. The Puritans did not celebrate heterosexuality, but rather marriage. They condemned all sexual expression outside the marriage bond and did not differentiate sharply between sodomy and heterosexual fornication. By the 1970s, however, the birth rate had dropped to under two. With the exception of the post-World War II baby boom, the decline has been continuous for two centuries, paralleling the spread of capitalist relations of production. It occurred even when access to contraceptive devices and abortion was systemically curtailed. The decline has included every segment of the population, urban and rural families, blacks and whites, ethnics and wasps, the middle class and the working class. As wage labor spread and production became socialized, then it became possible to release sexuality from the imperative to procreate. Ideologically, heterosexual expression came to be a means of establishing intimacy, promoting happiness, and experiencing pleasure. In divesting the household of its economic independence and fostering a separation of sexuality from procreation, capitalism has created conditions that allow some men and women to organize a personal life around their erotic emotional attraction to their own sex. It has made possible the formation of urban communities of lesbian and gay men and, more recently, of a politics based on a sexual identity. Evidence from colonial New England court records and church sermons indicates that male and female homosexual behavior existed in the 17th century. Homosexual behavior, however, is different from homosexual identity. There was quite simply no social space in the colonial system of production that allowed men and women to be gay. Survival was structured around participation in a nuclear family. There were certain homosexual acts, sodomy among men, lewdness among women, in which individuals engaged, but family was so pervasive that colonial society lacked even the category of homosexual or lesbian to describe a person. It is quite possible that some men and women experienced a stronger attraction to their own sex than to the opposite sex. In fact, some colonial court cases refer to men who persist in their unnatural attractions, but one could not fashion out of that preference a way of life. Colonial Massachusetts even had laws prohibiting unmarried adults from living outside family units. By the second half of the 19th century, this situation was noticeably changing as the capitalist system of free labor took hold only when individuals began to make their living through wage labor instead of as part of an 
interdependent family unit, was it possible for homosexual desire to coalesce into a personal identity, an identity based on the ability to remain outside of the heterosexual family and to construct a personal life based on one's attraction to one's own sex. By the end of the century, a class of men and women existed who recognized their erotic interest in their own sex, saw it as a trait that set them apart from the majority, and sought others like themselves. These early gay lives came from a wide social spectrum, civil servants and business executives, department store clerks and college professors, factory operatives, ministers, lawyers, cooks, domestics, hobos, and the idle rich, men and women, black and white, immigrant and native-born. In this period, gay men and lesbian began to invent ways of meeting each other and sustaining a group life. Already in the early 20th century, large cities contained male homosexual bars. Gay men staked out cruising areas, such as Riverside Drive in New York City and Lafayette Park in Washington. In St. Louis and the nation's capital, annual drag balls brought together large numbers of black men. Public bathhouses and YMCAs became gathering spots for male homosexuals. Lesbians formed literary societies and private social clubs. Some working-class women passed as men to obtain better-paying jobs and lived with other women, lesbian couples who appeared to the world as husband and wife. Among the faculty of women's colleges, in settlement houses, and the professional associations and clubs, that women formed, one could find lifelong intimate relationships supported by a web of lesbian friends. By the 1920s and 1930s, large cities such as New York and Chicago contained lesbian bars. These patterns of living could evolve because capitalism allowed individuals to survive beyond the confines of the family. Simultaneously, ideological definitions of homosexual behavior changed, Doctors developed theories about homosexuality, describing it as a condition, something that was inherent in a person, a part of his or her nature. These theories did not represent scientific breakthroughs, elucidations of previously undiscovered areas of knowledge. Rather, they were an ideological response to a new way of organizing one's life. The popularization of the medical model in turn affected the consciousness of the women and men who experienced homosexual desire, so that they came to define themselves through their erotic life. These new forms of gay identity and patterns of group life also reflected the difference of people according to gender, race, and class that is so pervasive in capitalist societies. Among whites, for instance, gay men have traditionally been more visible than lesbians, this partly stems from the division between the public male sphere and the private female sphere. Streets, parks, and bars, especially at night, were male space, yet the greater visibility of white gay men also reflected their larger numbers. The Kinsey studies of the 1940s and 50s found significantly more men than women with predominantly homosexual histories, a situation caused, I would argue, by the fact that capitalism had drawn far more men than women into the labor force, and at higher wages, men could more easily construct a personal life independent of attachments to the opposite sex, whereas women were more likely to remain economically dependent to men. Kinsey also found a strong positive correlation between years of schooling and lesbian activity. College-educated white women, far more able than their working-class sisters to support themselves, could survive more easily without intimate relationships with men. Among working-class immigrants in the early 20th century, closely-knit kin networks and an ethic of family solidarity placed constraints on individual autonomy that made gayness a difficult option to pursue. In contrast, for reasons not altogether clear, urban black communities appeared relatively tolerant of homosexuality. The popularity in the 1920s and 1930s of songs with lesbian and gay male themes, B.D. Women, Prove It On Me, Sissy Man, Fairy Blues, suggest an openness about homosexual expression at odds with the mores of whites. Among men in the rural West in the 1940s, Kinsey found extensive incidences of homosexual behavior, 
but in contrast with men in large cities, little consciousness of gay identity. Thus, even as capitalism exerted a homogenizing influence by gradually transforming more individuals into wage laborers and separating them from traditional communities, different groups of people were also affected in different ways. The decisions of particular men and women to act on their erotic emotional preference for the same sex along with the new consciousness of that preference made them different led to formation of an urban subculture of gay men and lesbians. Yet at least through the 1930s, this subculture remained rudimentary, unstable, and difficult to find. How then did the complex, well-developed gay community emerge that existed by the time the gay liberation movement exploded? The answer is to be found during World War II, a time when the cumulative changes of several decades coalesced into a qualitatively new shape. The war severely disrupted traditional patterns of gender relations and sexuality, and temporarily created a new erotic situation conducive to homosexual expression. It plucked millions of men and women whose sexual identities were just forming out of their homes, out of towns and small cities, out of the heterosexual environments of the family, and drop them into the sex-segregated situations as GIs, as WACs and WAVEs, in same-sex rooming houses for women workers who relocated to seek employment. The war freed millions of men and women from the settings where heterosexuality was normally imposed. For men and women already gay, it proved an opportunity to meet people like themselves, Others could become gay because of the temporary freedom to explore sexuality that the war provided. Lisa Ben, for instance, came out during the war. She left the small California town where she was raised, came to Los Angeles to find work, and lived in a woman's boarding house. There, she met for the first time lesbians who took her to gay bars and introduced her to other gay women. Donald Vinning was a young man with lots of homosexual desire and few gay experiences. He moved to New York City during the war and worked at a large YMCA. His diary reveals numerous erotic adventures with soldiers, sailors, marines, and civilians at the Y where he worked, as well as at the men's residence club where he lived, and in parks, bars, and movie theaters. Many GIs stayed in port cities like New York at YMCAs like the one where Vinning worked. In his oral histories of gay men in San Francisco focusing on the 1940s, Alan Baroub has found that the war years were critical in the formation of a gay male community in the city. Places as different as San Jose, Denver, and Kansas City had their first gay bars in the 1940s. Even severe repression could have positive side effects. Pat Bond, a lesbian from Davenport, Iowa, joined the WACs during the 1940s. Caught in a purge of hundreds of lesbians from the WACs in the Pacific, she did not return to Iowa. She stayed in San Francisco and became part of a community of lesbians. How many other women and men had comparable experiences? How many other cities saw rapid growth of lesbian and gay male communities? The gay men and women of the 1940s were pioneers. Their decisions to act on their desires formed the underpinnings of an urban subculture of gay men and lesbians. Throughout the 1950s and 1960s, the gay subculture grew and stabilized so that people coming out then could more easily find other gay women and men than in the past. Newspaper and magazines published articles describing gay male life. Literally hundreds of novels with lesbian themes were published. Psychoanalysts complained about the new ease with which the gay male patients found sexual partners. And the gay subculture was not just to be found in the largest cities. Lesbian and gay male bars existed in places like Worcester, Massachusetts, and Buffalo, New York, in Columbia, South Carolina, and Des Moines, Iowa. Gay life in the 1950s and 1960s became a nationwide phenomenon. By the time of the Stonewall Riots in New York City in 1969, the event that ignited the gay liberation movement, our situation was hardly one of silence. 
invisibility, and isolation, a massive grassroots liberation movement could form almost overnight precisely because communities of lesbians and gay men existed. Although gay community was a precondition for a mass movement, the oppression of lesbians and gay men was the force that propelled the movement into existence, as the subculture expanded and grew more visible in the post-World War II era, oppression by the state intensified, becoming more systematic and inclusive. The right scapegoated sexual perverts during the McCarthy era. Eisenhower imposed a total ban on the employment of gay women and men by the federal government and government contractors. Purges of lesbians and homosexuals from the military rose sharply. The FBI instituted widespread surveillance of gay meeting places and of lesbian and gay organizations such as the Daughters of Bilitis and the Mattachine Society. The post office placed tracers on the correspondence of gay men and passed evidence of homosexual activity on to employers. Urban vice squads invaded private homes, made sweeps of lesbian and gay male bars, and trapped gay men in public places and fomented local witch hunts. The danger involved in being gay rose even as the possibilities of being gay were enhanced. Gay liberation was a response to this contradiction. Although lesbians and gay men won significant victories in the 1970s and opened up some safe social space in which to exist, we can hardly claim to have dealt a fatal blow to heterosexism and homophobia. One could even argue that the enforcement of gay oppression has merely changed locales, shifting somewhat from the state to the arena of extra-legal violence in the form of increasingly open physical attacks on lesbians and gay men. And, as our movement has grown, they have generated a backlash that threatens to wipe out our gains. Significantly, this new right opposition has taken shape as a pro-family movement. How is it that capitalism, whose structure made possible the emergence of a gay identity and the creation of urban gay communities, appears unable to accept gay men and lesbians in its midst? Why do heterosexism and homophobia appear so resistant to assault? The answers, I think, can be found in the contradictory relationship of capitalism to family. On the one hand, as I argued earlier, capitalism has gradually undermined the material basis of the nuclear family by taking away the economic functions that cemented the ties between family members. As more adults have been drawn into the free labor system, and as capitalism has expanded its sphere until it produces, as commodities, most goods and services we need for our survival, the forces that propelled men and women into families and kept them there have weakened. On the other hand, the ideology of capitalist society has enshrined the family as the source of love, affection, and emotional security, the place where our need for stable, intimate human relationships is satisfied. This elevation of the nuclear family to preeminence in the sphere of personal life is not accidental. Every society needs structures for reproduction and childbearing, but the possibilities are not limited to the nuclear family. Yet the privatized family fits well with capitalist relations of production. Capitalism has socialized production while maintaining that the products of socialized labor belong to the owners of private property. In many ways, child-rearing has also been progressively socialized over the last two centuries, with schools, the media, peer groups, and employers taking over functions that once belonged to parents. Nevertheless, capitalist society maintains that reproduction and child-rearing are private tasks. The child belong to parents who exercise rights of ownership. Ideologically, capitalism drives people into heterosexual families. Each generation comes to age having internalized a heterosexist model of intimacy and personal relationships. Materially, capitalism weakens the bonds that once kept families together so that their members experience a growing instability in the place they have come to expect happiness and emotional security. Thus, while capitalism has knocked the material foundation away from family life, lesbians, gay men, and heterosexual feminists have become the scapegoats 
for the social instability of the system. This analysis, if persuasive, has implications for us today. It can affect our perception of our identity, our formulation of political goals, and our decisions about strategy. I have argued that lesbian and gay identity and communities are historically created the result of a process of capitalist development that has spanned many generations. A corollary of this argument is that we are not a fixed social minority composed for all time of a certain percentage of the population. There are more of us than 100 years ago, more of us than 40 years ago, and there may very well be more gay men and lesbians in the future. Claims made by gay and non-gays that sexual orientation is fixed at an early age, the large numbers of visible gay men and lesbians in society, the media, and the schools will have no influence on the sexual identities of the young, are wrong. Capitalism has created the material conditions for homosexual desire to express itself as a central component of some individuals' lives. Now, our political movements are changing consciousness, creating the ideological conditions to make it easier for people to make that choice. To be sure, this argument confirms the worst fears and most rabid rhetoric of our political opponents, but our response must be to challenge the underlying belief that homosexual relations are bad, a poor second choice. We must not slip into opportunist defense that society need not worry about tolerating us since only homosexuals become homosexuals. At best, a minority group analysis and a civil rights strategy pertain to those of us who are already gay. It leaves today's youth, tomorrow's lesbians and gay men, to internalize heterosexist models that it can take a lifetime to expunge. I have also argued that capitalism has led to the separation of sexuality from procreation. Human sexual desire need no longer be harnessed to reproductive imperatives, to procreation. Its expression has increasingly entered the realm of choice. Lesbians and homosexuals most clearly embody the potential of this split, since our gay relationships stand entirely outside a procreative framework. The acceptance of our erotic choices ultimately depends on the degree to which society is willing to affirm sexual expression as a form of play, positive and life-enhancing. Our movement may have begun as the struggle of a minority, but what we should now be trying to liberate is an aspect of the personal lives of all people, sexual expression. Finally, I've suggested that the relationship between capitalism and the family is fundamentally contradictory. On one hand, capitalism continually weakens the material foundation of family life, making it impossible for individuals to live outside the family, and for a lesbian and gay male identity to develop. On the other hand, it needs to push men and women into families, at least long enough to reproduce the next generation of workers. The elevation of the family to ideological preeminence guarantees that capitalist society will reproduce not just children, but heterosexism and homophobia. In the most profound sense, capitalism is the problem. How do we avoid remaining scapegoats, the political victims of the social instability that capitalism generates? How can we take this contradictory relationship and use it to move forward liberation? Gay men and lesbians exist on social terrain beyond the boundaries of the heterosexual nuclear family. Our communities have formed in that social space. Our survival and liberation depend on our ability to defend and expand that terrain, not just for ourselves, but for everyone. That means, in part, support for issues that broaden the opportunities for living outside traditional heterosexual family units. Issues like the availability of abortion and the ratification of equal rights amendments, affirmative social services, decent welfare payments, full employment, the rights of young people, in other words, programs and issues that provide a material basis for personal autonomy. The rights of young people are especially critical. The acceptance of children as dependents, as belonging to parents, is so deeply ingrained that we can scarcely imagine what it would mean 
to treat them as autonomous human beings, particularly in the realm of sexual expression and choice. Yet until that happens, gay liberation will remain out of our reach. But the autonomy is only half the story. The instability of families and the sense of impermanence and insecurity that people are now experiencing in their personal relationships are real social problems that need to be addressed. We need political solutions for these difficulties of personal life. These solutions should not come in the form of a radical version of the pro-life family position of some left-wing proposals to strengthen the family. Socialists do not generally respond to the exploitation and economic inequality of industrial capitalism by calling for a return to the family farm and handicraft production. We recognize the vastly increasing productivity that capitalism has made possible by socializing production is one of its progressive features. Similarly, we should not be trying to turn back the clock to some mythic age of the happy family. We do need, however, structures and programs that will help dissolve the boundaries that isolate the family, particularly those that privatize child-rearing. We need community or worker-controlled daycare, housing where privacy and community coexist, neighborhood institutions, from medical clinics to performance centers that enlarge the social unit where each of us has a secure place. As we create structures beyond the nuclear family that provide a sense of belonging, the family will wane in significance. Less and less will it seem to make or break our emotional security. In this respect, gay men and lesbians are well situated to play a special role. Already excluded from families as most of us are, we have had to create, for our survival, networks of support that do not depend on the bonds of blood, or the license of the state, but that are freely chosen and nurtured. The building of an affectional community must be as much a part of our political movement as our campaigns for civil rights. In this way, we may prefigure the shape of personal relationships in a society grounded in equality and justice rather than exploitation and oppression, a society where autonomy and security do not preclude each other, but rather coexist.